Um, well, I want to uh, welcome everyone <coughs> excuse me, to uh, the first of two sessions at the meeting on the neuroimmunology of the skin. Today's is titled Regulation of Cutaneous Immunity by the Nervous System. Uh, tomorrow morning there will be a second session uh, moderated by Ethan Lerner, which will be uh, uh, sort of the other way around, uh, titled uh, Regulation of the Nervous System by the Immune System. And I think, uh, I hope that you'll find both of these to be uh, really interesting and important. Um, neuroimmunology is a field that is really now uh, coming into its own. I think that it's obvious that there are, uh, there is uh, important regulatory interactions and crosstalk between the nervous system and the immune system. To dermatologists, this seems, I think, uh, rather obvious. Um, we certainly are very aware that stress and um, um, uh, neurologic status influence skin disease. Uh, for example, um, Parkinson's uh, disease and seborrheic dermatitis. It's uh, well known that the phenotypic expression of psoriasis depends on innervation, et cetera, et cetera. So to us, uh, in our everyday practices, uh, we see uh, the evidence right uh, before our eyes. Um, we have a 90 minutes uh, to this morning for four uh, talks. And I'm not going to uh, take too much time away from the speakers because I think that we have a very uh, full um, session today. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Jonathan Gaynor uh, from the Cochin Institute in Paris. I first met Dr. Gaynor in 2014 at something called the Second International Nerve Driven, Driven uh, uh, Immunology a Meeting in Stockholm. Uh, his research uh, is on uh, investigating the mechanisms of neuroimmune uh, control of mucosal virus, viral infections. I was very impressed by what he had to say, and I hope that everybody uh, here will be impressed by what he has to say. Uh, Dr. Gaynor will be speaking on the topic of calcitonin gene-related peptide inhibits Langerhans cell-mediated HIV-1 transmission. Jonathan. Um, so, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, Rick, for the for the introduction and the invitation, actually, to be here in this meeting. Uh, it's uh, it's a great pleasure. It's a great honor. Uh, so, I'm uh, Jonathan Ganon from the Cochin Institute in Paris, and today I will speak to you about the neuropeptide calcitonin gene-related peptide, or CGRP, that inhibits Langerhans cell-mediated uh, uh, HIV transmission. So. Uh, some of you might have had sex this morning. Some of you are probably or still maybe having it. And for those of you who decided to came here instead, uh, uh, let's try and just talk a bit about sex and have some uh, 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 virtual relationships. So this is just to remind you that HIV-1 is a sexually transmitted virus. And what this uh, also means is that more than 85% of HIV transmission occurs during sexual intercourse. What does this mean practically? It means that mucosal surfaces are the main uh, portal of entry uh, for HIV-1. So uh, uh, HIV entry at these mucosal sites obviously depends both on the mucosal architecture as well as the presence of different uh, uh, immune cells in these epithelia that can be targeted by uh, HIV. So uh, for example, in the uh, female genital tract, HIV enters across uh, cervicovaginal uh, uh, epithelia, and it has been uh, shown that following exposure to HIV-infected cells, the virus can actually directly infect uh, CD4, CCR5 expressing T cells, uh, as well as macrophages. In addition, uh, HIV can also be internalized by Langerhans cell, which will be the focus of my talk today. Uh, uh, and this internalized virus can then be transmitted from Langerhans cells to T cell in a process that we call uh, transinfection. What about the male genital tracts? So this actually and historically remained uh, uh, largely elusive uh, for some time. And uh, again, this is just to remind you, boys and girls, and especially boys, that men can actually be infected via their penis. And for example, uh, penile infection accounts for approximately 30% of uh, transmission cases uh, in MSM. And so this is where actually our skin comes into the picture, and especially our, 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 the foreskin, which is one of two potential HIV entry sites within the penis, the second being the urethra, on which I will not uh, speak today. And uh, in fact, we uh, became interested in the foreskin practically at the same time where our three uh, our clinical trials demonstrated that male circumcision reduces by 
approximately 60% the risk of HIV acquisition by men. So how to study uh, 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 HIV entry in the foreskin? For this, we first developed two uh, experimental uh, models. The first is an uh, ex vivo mucosal tissue explant. So uh, at the beginning, we used uh, foreskin tissues that are removed during circumcision. Later on, uh, uh, we also managed to get whole penile tissues that are removed uh, 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 during uh, gender uh, reassignment surgery. And we actually take small pieces of uh, uh, this uh, tissues, we place them in, in a two-chamber system, and then we glue a hollow cylinder uh, on top. In parallel, we also uh, develop our, our in vitro immunocompotent reconstruction models. So basically, again, we use a two-chamber system. We seed first epithelial cells, then, uh, uh, sorry, fibroblasts. We then add epithelial cells, and we can integrate different immune cells depending on the mucosa that we are trying to uh, reconstruct. And the advantage, of course, of uh, both of these models is that they permit for polarized exposure to HIV, which is what will happen uh, uh, in real life. So uh, using this model, we describe the, the chain of events of uh, uh, HIV, the early HIV entry within the inner foreskin. We are speaking here about uh, between one and four hours uh, post-infection. So following uh, uh, exposure to HIV-infected cells, the virus actually rapidly enters the epithelial compartment of the inner foreskin. Uh, in parallel, this exposure to HIV-infected cells induces a secretion first of TSLP that actually recruits LCs to the apical surface where they can easily like, capture the virus, and then they migrate back to the uh, uh, basement membrane. And the second chemokine which is secreted is CCL5, again by epithelial cells. This is a T-cell chemokine, and as expected, it actually recruits T-cells from the dermis into the epidermis, and this fuels a, a continuous formation of conjugates between LCs and T-cells, which will uh, later permit for uh, transinfection. And you can actually see it here in this uh, uh, um, electron microscopy image. You can see in blue Langerhans cells containing a typical Baerbeck granule in the cytoplasm as well as some internalized virions. And you can see the virions uh, that are transferred to T cell at the close contact between uh, the two t cell types. So. Um, one of the major things that we are actually trying to do in, in the lab is, of course, to develop an HIV vaccine or at least a micro B side that will be able to uh, block the early events of uh, HIV transmission. And in order to do so, uh, uh, we need to understand what can actually control the function of uh, these uh, uh, mucosal immune cells. And uh, we hypothesized some years ago that uh, peripheral neurons, for example, nociceptors that actually innervate all mucosal epithelia uh, might uh, have a role, and these have been uh, uh, actually uh, ignored in most studies. So uh, these neurons are usually classified either as uh, slow C fibers or uh, faster A uh, delta fibers. They are actually bipolar. They have one axon which is split uh, uh, into two branches, a peripheral and a central branch, and they are usually polymodal, meaning that they can sense different types of uh, noxious uh, stimuli, and uh, as you know, they do do this uh, uh, via the activation of a bunch of uh, uh, surface ion channel, the most famous one being TRPV1, that can actually be uh, activated by capsaicin and uh, resinifera toxin that are both uh, are derived from uh, plants. So following such activation, not only that pain information will be transmitted to the central nervous system, but it was actually realized more than 100 years ago that actually there is also some uh, uh, peripheral effect, which is peripheral vasodilatation, and we know today that this is due to the uh, uh, release of uh, CGRP. And so um, we came across this very elegant study from uh, Rick's lab some time ago, uh, which was actually the first one to demonstrate that LCs in the skin are in contact with these uh, uh, CGRP-positive neurons, and that CGRP can actually affect uh, several uh, functions of uh, LCs. So uh, based on all of this, we actually asked a simple question, could CGRP uh, affect LCs-mediated HIV uh, transinfection? So the first thing that we did was to look whether LCs express the CGRP receptor. So CGRP actually belongs to a, a, a larger family of uh, peptide, the calcitonin family of peptide, which uh, uh, have kind of uh, different receptors that are part of a family of receptors. The one for CGRP is actually a combination of calcitonin receptor-like receptor, or CLR, that associate, uh, associates with a transmembrane protein called uh, RAMP1. And indeed, using uh, our PCR, we demonstrated that LCs express CLR and RAMP1. They don't express RAMP2 and 3. And they express a third uh, intracellular uh, uh, protein called RCP, which is important for uh, CGRP receptor uh, signalization. So the receptor is there. The question is whether it's functional. And if so, what does CGRP do in the context of uh, our HIV transmission? So to study this, we obtained monocytes from blood. 
We cultivate them uh, in a, a medium containing GM CSF, IL-4, TGF beta for a week, which gives rise to monocytes derived Langerhans cells or MDLCs. We then treat the cells with CGRP, pulse them with the virus, wash the virus away, and then further culture the cells uh, with autologous CD4 T cells. And a week later, we take the supernatants and we measure uh, uh, viral replication by ELISA or by uh, FAX. And as you can see here, CGRP in a time and dose dependent manner actually inhibits uh, transinfection, reaching uh, around 75% uh, inhibition following a uh, 24 hour treatment with 100 nanomolar uh, CGRP. And this action is indeed mediated by the CGRP receptor because it can be blocked by the CGRP receptor antagonist, CGRP 837, which is a, a fragment of uh, CGRP. So, uh, to try and understand uh, uh, what is going on here, we actually performed the gene array using uh, CGRP versus untreated uh, NDLCs, and we were rather surprised to see that among the uh, uh, um, most uh, uh, highly upregulated genes were those of CGRP itself as well as uh, some components of the CGRP receptor. So uh, uh, we confirmed the expression of the, of the receptor by PCR and uh, immunofluorescent mic microscopy as well as the increased secretion of CGRP. So this just suggests that whatever effect of uh, CGRP, it will actually induce kind of an autocrine, paracrine uh, uh, feedback loop in LCs which will actually uh, reinforce its, uh, its uh, uh, activities uh, even for further. So uh, we then wanted to try and understand how does CGRP inhibit LCs mediated HIV transinfection. So actually it turned out to be a, a, a combination of different mechanisms. There is no just one single mechanism. It's several that actually cooperate together. And I'll try to uh, uh, describe some of these uh, uh, mechanisms uh, now. So the first thing that we did, we looked at signaling. So uh, the CGRP receptor is actually a seven transmembrane G protein coupled receptor that usually are couples to adenylate cyclase, uh, cyclic AMP and PKA. However, it's known that uh, uh, the receptor can actually activate other uh, G uh, alpha uh, independent uh, signaling pathway. So again, looking back at our gene array, uh, two transcription factors came, uh, came up, uh, namely NF kappa B and STAT4. So we repeated some uh, transinfection experiment using uh, 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 Bay 11 uh, 7082, which is an NF kappa B inhibitor, and lysophilin, which is a STAT4 inhibitor. And as you can see, the bars in pink, these actually abrogate the inhibition mediated by CGRP. In contrast, the uh, H89, which is a non-specific PKA inhibitor, you can see it in gray, actually has no effect. And this actually goes in line with uh, our previous studies showing that the inhibition of ELSI's antigen presentation is not mediated by cyclic AMP, although uh, CGRP does uh, uh, induce an increase in uh, cyclic AMP in ELSI's. And uh, on the other side, CGRP was uh, demonstrated to inhibit nf kappa B activation in uh, LPS-stimulated ELSI's. So uh, as uh, STAT4 is actually mandatory for CCR5 expression, this is one of the core receptor uh, that is uh, involved in HIV binding and entry. Uh, uh, we uh, looked again in, at the gene array, and uh, indeed CCR5 levels uh, uh, went down, while those of CCR4, which is another uh, uh, HIV core receptor, actually go up. So again, confirming this by uh, flow cytometry. And actually, if you uh, compare uh, uh, transinfection, uh, the effect of CGRP on transinfection of uh, R5 and X4 viruses, you see that that of R5 actually goes down, as expected, while that of X4 actually goes up. However, we do think that uh, uh, CGRP, uh, uh, its relevance during uh, mucosal transmission will be uh, against R5, which are uh, the viruses that are, are most exclusively uh, the ones transferred during uh, uh, sexual uh, uh, intercourse. So then we looked a bit at some um, more intracellular mechanisms. So as you know, uh, LCs express a unique C-type lectin called Langerine that actually serves as an uh, H HIV attachment receptor. And uh, following binding of uh, HIV to Langerine, most of the virus is delivered to endolysosome and is degraded. And it's actually the virus that escapes degradation, usually at high doses of, uh, uh, of uh, HIV, that can be transmitted to T cells. And so we wondered whether uh, CGRP might have any effect on this uh, process. And so we just measured the intracellular content of HIV. And it seems that degradation is actually more efficient and uh, uh, going faster. So we said, OK, so CGRP probably uh, interferes in some way with the kinetics of endolysosomal degradation. However, it turned out not to be the case. And what we found is that uh, CGRP actually diverts HIV from endolysosome to the proteasome. And this mode of degradation is actually uh, uh, more efficient. And we demonstrated this using 
using specific uh, inhibitors of endolysosomes such as ammonium chloride and uh, proteasome uh, such as uh, lactocystine. And you can see HIV transinfection uh, uh, is increased uh, from untreated cells when blocking endolysosomal degradation and is increased from uh, uh, CGRP treated cells, uh, these are the blue bars, uh, when you uh, uh, include lactocystine in these experiments. And so we spoke, uh, I showed some mechanism uh, relating to uh, uh, LCs themselves, but again for transinfection you also need T cells and you need contact with T cells, so we look at the adhesive potential of LCs and first found that uh, CGRP actually decreases some uh, uh, adhesion molecule and trying to see what happens uh, ex vivo, again using our uh, ex vivo uh, explant uh, model, when you can see in red that following exposure to HIV infected cells there is indeed an increase in uh, LCT cell conjugates, however when you first treat your explants with CGRP, you completely uh, uh, block uh, this effect. So these are some of the mechanisms uh, actually we are uh, trying to figure out even deeper what is going on and the question is whether you can take all of this uh, uh, knowledge and information and translate it from uh, bench to bedside which is something that we are actively trying to do. So uh, actually, uh, following the discovery of uh, CGRP back in uh, 1982 by Susan Amara, it was uh, uh, very uh, quickly realized by another Susan, Susan Brain this time, that CGRP is actually a potent vasodilator. And as such, you can imagine that it will probably be involved in different pathologies, which is indeed the case. For example, uh, in migraine, you have increased plasma levels of CGRP, and this is detrimental. And actually, the new line of uh, uh, treatment or defense against migraine are actually anti-CGRP and anti-CGRP receptors or antibodies that are actually uh, are now in phase three clinical trials and are extremely effective. On the other side, uh, for example, in hypertension, you actually have decreased levels of uh, CGRP in plasma, and this is uh, CGRP that is actually needed and beneficial. And uh, interestingly, the TRPV1 ag agonist through thiocartin, uh, which is actually used in uh, Chinese uh, uh, medicine, uh, in traditional uh, Chinese medicine. This is actually a TRP1 agonist uh, uh, that is used against uh, uh, hypertension. So we wondered what happens in HIV-infected patients. These are uh, uh, very recent data that we still didn't publish and I want to share with you. So uh, this is just to show you a basic course of HIV infection. You have an acute phase, a chronic phase, and uh, if uh, kept untreated, this actually results in uh, AIDS and finally death. And you can see, uh, at least for CD4, that's the blue line, that uh, uh, you have a setup point during the acute phase and uh, actually a, a gradual decline of, uh, uh, of CD4 T cell. And so uh, uh, we managed to get samples from uh, different groups of HIV infected patients during primary or chronic infection and uh, measured CGRP plasma levels in these patients and compared it to uh, uninfected control as well as two additional control groups exposed to negatives and long-term non-progressors. And as you can see, uh, uh, both control groups have similar levels of CGRP. In PHI patients, you have a significant decrease in CGRP plasma levels, and this even goes further down in uh, CHI patients. And actually, if you pull all of uh, these patients together, you see a correlation between CGRP plasma levels and CD4 counts. So it really suggests that you have a gradual uh, loss or decrease of uh, CGRP, and we suggest that or think that CGRP might actually be a novel uh, biomarker for HIV disease progression, and in additional support for this, when uh, we could follow up some of these patients before and after initiation of combination antiretroviral therapy, CR, and it actually normalizes uh, CGRP levels. So uh, what this also suggests is that uh, uh, the um, levels of CGRP or the decreased CGRP is not just uh, due to uh, a neuronal loss, which is uh, known to happen as HIV can induce uh, injury of peripheral neurons, and uh, some uh, CR combinations are actually neurotoxin. This is something that you can uh, measure uh, um, when counting or measuring intra-epidermal nerve fiber density in small fiber neuropathies that are uh, common in some uh, HIV-infected patients. So where does CGRP come from or the decreased and the normalized CGRP come from is something that we are still working on for now, uh, uh, we don't know. And finally, uh, to try and see whether this can go to the clinic, we did some preliminary experiments in uh, human BLT mice uh, that were uh, treated with CGRP before an HIV vaginal challenge. As you can see, CGRP has the capacity to uh, uh, inhibit the uh, increase in uh, 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 viral load. So that's the first experiment that we did. Of course, it needs to be repeated and optimized, uh, 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 but it does seem that CGRP can be uh, uh, clinically effective. 
So in summary, following binding of HIV to Langerhin, virus is uh, uh, degraded in endolysosomes, and the virus that actually escapes uh, this degradation can transinfect T cells. Uh, CGRP can activate its receptor on Langerhin cells to first induce increase in CGRP receptor and CGRP itself. Uh, this results, for example, in CCR5 down regulation, uh, uh, degradation of virus via the proteasome, and uh, decrease in adhesive potential, and all of these together actually strongly uh, inhibit uh, transinfection, and therefore we think that CGRP receptor agonists that we are currently trying to develop uh, might turn out extremely useful clinically to block uh, uh, mucosal HIV transmission. So finally, just to thank uh, Morgan Bomsell, uh, the head of our laboratory of mucosal uh, entry of HIV and mucosal immunity, our lab members, and especially all the uh, uh, clinicians that uh, we work with. And uh, I thank you for your attention. It was great having sex with you this morning, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. That was terrific. Uh, we have time for one or two questions. Yeah. Hey, uh, this is a great talk. Hello. Um, so uh, you clearly are showing that there's effects of CGRP on uh, Langerhans cells, but do you think that there's also uh, effects uh, in trans, where CGRP affects the Langerhans cells and in turn uh, secretes something that affects the cells around it? Yeah, so we actually looked at this, and uh, one of the molecules that is secreted is uh, uh, MIP3 alpha, which is actually a CCR5 binding chemokine. And we actually showed that once this is secreted from CGRP, this will actually block CCR5 on T cell and will block transinfection by affecting T cells. Although CGRP doesn't affect, in this context, directly T cell, uh, it does it like this in that way, yeah. Okay, um, if we have time at the end, uh, we'll take more questions from everybody. So thank you so much. Thank you. Wow, thanks for that uh, terrific talk. Our next speaker is someone that really needs no introduction. She is uh, basically uh, runs the uh, Society for Investigative Dermatology. Um, uh, she, has, she is uh, interested in many things, but uh, particularly uh, relevant for today's discussion, uh, the neural activation of skin inflammation and proliferation. Uh, she's one of the uh, um, uh, most prominent and uh, most productive immunologists in uh, cutaneous biology. Uh, and of course, I'm talking about Nicole Ward, who's going to talk to us about animal models of psoriasiform dermatitis, influence of the nervous system. Nicole. Good. That was like such a kind introduction. I'm nervous now. Um, <laughs> I have lots of help, as you will see. So I'm totally in awe of what we just saw um, and the concept of how the nervous system can interact with virus. And I'm going to actually touch on that a little bit at the end of my talk, um, which is venturing into new domains for me. But I'm going to come back um, to sort of what my passion is, is, which is psoriasis, um, in which I'm, I'm most well known for. These are my disclosures. So most of you are probably all aware of chronic plaque psoriasis. It affects about 1 to 2 percent of the population. It can range from mild to very severe, where 100 percent of a person's body surface area is covered by these well-demarcated red, silvery scale plaque. Um, not only do patients have skin disease, but we know it's systemic in nature. It's, it's more than skin deep, and they suffer from many comorbidities, including cardiovascular disease, liver disease, kidney disease, uveitis, and, and cardiovascular disease, which they shortens their lifespan from five to seven years. When we look histologically um, at skin, it's remarkable because the plaque that's directly adjacent to that normal-looking skin changes so dramatically. And you can see in this slide that I'm showing, um, let's see here, if we can use a pointer. Yeah, that's not going to work. All right, so you can see in the histology that you can move from, in the, in the bottom left-hand corner, how normal-looking skin looks. And then simply centimeters away, you get this huge proliferation in the keratinocytes. 
and you get a huge influx of immune cells that come into the skin and then drive the communication and the, and the inflammation that's characteristic of the disease. And these cells that are trafficking into the skin and communicating with each other are pathogenic. Um, we know that some trigger in a genetically susceptible population stimulates all this. And you get shedding of, of self-DNA, it interacts with um, dendritic cells, these dendritic cells traffic back to the, the skin draining lymph node, interact with T cells which then traffic back to the skin and initiate and sustain this inflammatory skin phenotype. And blocking it at several levels with a biologic can drive the disease into remission. Which is one of the things that's less, much less well understood is the role of the nervous system. And we know that for years now, since the early 80s, um, or the late 80s, I think that's 1986, 1989, 1990, I was graduating from high school at this point, Eugene Farber was proposing a role for the nervous system in regulating psoriasis, in part because there was symmetry to it, in part because um, plaque seemed to get exacerbated with stress, and, and really this remarkable finding that when patients underwent skin denervation, either by accident or by having knee replacement surgery, their plaque would resolve which is what you're seeing in, in, in the figure, demarcated figure four here. One side of this person has plaque on their knee and the other side it's gone and he'd had surgery. And then in the color picture, which a patient emailed to me and said I could use in my presentations, which is cool as a PhD scientist. And you can see she had plaque on one side and the side she had knee replacement surgery, the plaque went away completely. And so, you know, Eugene Farber postulated way back then that substance P may play a role in this. So as a mouse model person, I kept thinking, well, you know, we, may, we must have an ability to model this. How do we identify the mechanisms by which this happens? And could we take advantage of some of the mouse models in my lab to figure this out? So I use this slide a lot because I really, it really shows how huge mouse model literature has increased as we've learned more about the pathogenesis above, of psoriasis. You can see since 65, there's been a huge increase in the number of total publications um, using psoriasis and mouse model as a literature search. In fact, there's more than 45 unique mouse models out there modeling aspects of, of psoriasis. The most, the most used one I would think now across the world is the topical imiquimod model where you put Aldara uh, onto the back of the animal or on their ear skin and you get a phenotype that resembles some aspects of psoriasis. Um, <laughs> And there's more than 100 unique mice that have had Aldara put onto them, or Amiquimod. It's insane. More than 111 pa papers last year alone came out. Um, and we, we wrote a commentary about this called <laughs> the snowballing literature um, of, of this model, Amiquimod in psoriasis. This is actually the first mouse model I ever engineered. It's called the KC Tie 2 mouse. We overexpressed tyrosine kinase receptor in, in epidermal keratinocytes, activates it, and they get this histological and gross phenotype that resembles some aspects of the disease. When we compare it to human psoriasis, you can appreciate that some aspects are there and some are absent, but most importantly, it was Th1, Th17 uh, driven. It had um, hyper proliferation of the keratinocytes, it had increases in the chemokines and cytokines that were characteristic of psoriasis, and it responded to drugs that psoriasis patients responded to. It was proteomically and genomically similar to human disease when we compared it to patients, and also important was that it responded to drugs patients in the clinic responded to and failed to respond to drugs that patients in the clinic didn't respond to. So we thought it was a good model. So what we did was we looked to see if there were increases in the nerves in the skin of these mice, because that's what people were reporting in psoriasis patient skin, and, and we found that there were increases. And then we decided we were going to try to eliminate those nerves. And so, pardon my art, this is actually me drawing. Um, and so what we did was we, we created a model where we cut the mouse skin in half, down the midline, opened it up pulled out the, cuna the cutaneous nerves on one side and left the other side untouched as sham-operated surgery, closed it back up, stapled it shut, 
let the mouse wake up, and you could immediately tell which side was denervated by poking the skin with a pin, and the mouse wouldn't turn to pay attention to it. And then we confirmed it at the histological level that the nerves were gone, and then we looked at the skin. And remarkably, it modeled what people were reporting in patients, that in the denervated side, the acanthosis or the epidermal thickness got significantly thinner. And because mouse models are criticized so much, we looked at two other mouse models. We used the amiquimod model and we used a model where we injected IL-21 into the, into the dermis and showed that if you eliminated the nerves of the skin, it resulted in the same thing. When we started looking histologically, we found that the dendritic cells were also decreased, as were the T cells in each of these models. And when we looked at a time course of it, the dendritic cells dropped very rapidly within a day of the surgery. This corresponded to a decrease in IL-23, which Dan Kaplan's going to tell you a little bit more about in his model system, which is really cool. And then we got decreases in acanthosis, and then finally the T cells followed. What you're going to see is other people have validated this. It's not just unique to our group, which is always nice to see. It holds up. And it's been broadened beyond psoriasis. It holds up in, in basal cell carcinoma. And what you'll see in a bit, uh, it, it works in cutaneous immunity as well. How? How does this work? So remember, the nerves of the skin, the nerve cell bodies reside back in the dorsal root ganglia that lie you know, adjacent to the vertebral column. So we went into the mouse, we dissected them out, and we did PCR, quantitative RT-PCR, as well as some microarray. And what we found was that substance P and CGRP were significantly elevated, suggesting that they're transported down to the skin and released. And so using those two as target um, peptides, we denervated mice, we put peptides back in, we kept mice innervated, and we blocked those two peptides, and then we looked at those three outcomes that I just showed you. And what we found was that there were peptide-specific effects. Substance P and CGRP both affected the T cells. CGRP could affect the uh, keratinocytes. Substance P did not. And substance P affected the dendritic cells, but not the epidermal thickness or the keratinocytes. So we were interested in pursuing both of these as mechanisms of action, but we started first looking at substance P. Now, substance P binds in part to neurokinin receptors. Neurokinin 1 receptor 1 was the one we were interested in. And we were hypothesized that nerve-derived substance P could bind neurokinin 1 receptor on both the T cells and the dendritic cells to drive and promote the skin inflammation. So we took two approaches, and this is all unpublished data that I'm going to show you now. First, we back crossed the KC tie 2 mouse to the neurokinin 1 receptor mouse. Um, and then looked at how the skin changed. And secondly, we did that acute model where we put topical amiquimod onto the backs of these mice. So we have a chronic model where there's skin disease that's already established, and then look at the disease. In this case, we're just doing the genetic back cross. And then we have this acute model where you have the mice and you just paint them and look seven days later. And so what's interesting is that, <laughs> I mean, this is years of work, right? The back crossing experiments. Um, there was absolutely no effect in the absence of neurokinin 1 receptor on the acanthosis. And when E got this data, she was upset. And I said to her, don't panic. Remember, there was no effect um, when we did the reconstitution experiments looking at substance P effects on the, on, the, on the epidermal thickness. Don't panic yet. Then she looked at the dendritic cells. And, and you know this was consistent with what we'd seen previously, that the dendritic cells decreased in the chronic model and also in the acute model. But we couldn't find any decreases in IL-23 or any other dendritic cell-derived cytokines. And I was like, well, maybe it's because you're doing whole skin. You're drowning out the effect. You know, the keratinocytes are very loud. You're not getting an immune cell-specific phenotype. So she actually went in, laser captured out the cells, and did the same thing, and again, found absolutely no change in, in cytokines derived from these cells, which was disappointing after such hard work. Then she looked at the CD4 cells, and what she found was that in the acute model, they didn't increase in the knockout mouse, which was kind of cool. But in the chronic model, they didn't change. So suggesting a model-specific outcome, model-specific effect. And again, she didn't 
find any changes in the T cell derived cytokines, which was frustrating as you can imagine, even when we laser captured the mode. So we started to postulate, well, maybe it's not the resident skin cells. Maybe it's the cells that are infiltrating in. So how could we look at the role of those while keeping the skin resident cells competent with the receptor? And the best way to do this is to take bone marrow from the neurokinin 1 receptor mouse, right? Transplant that into the KC Ti2 mice or do it um, into a wild type mouse and then put Aldara onto the back of the skin. So it's a great way to model and separate out the role of the skin resident cells versus the circulating immune cells that traffic into the skin in psoriasis like inflammation. And this is a lot of data, but what you can probably see is that there's no asterisk indicating significance <laughs> and that the clear open bars look exactly like the clear black bars no matter what we looked at and no matter whether we looked in back skin or ear skin. Um, and large ends I hope you saw, ends of 11, but was What's crazy was, and this is in whole skin lysates, what you're looking at here, is remarkably the T cell derived cytokines increased as well as some of the antigen presenting cell cytokines increased. IL-17 A and F went up as well as interferon gamma. Similar increases were found when we did it in the bone marrow transplant into the wild type mouse and then put Aldara onto the back of the skin. So collectively what these data suggest is that neurokinin 1 receptor may have opposing roles in skin resident versus inflammatory cells that circulate into the skin. The ones that live in the skin promote inflammation and the ones that traffic in actually suppress it. So when you get rid of that receptor interactions with those cells that come in, you get an increase in inflammation. We've now made a Phlox neurokinin 1 receptor mouse and are going to look at it more carefully in collaboration with uh, Adriana Laragina at University of Pittsburgh. So stay tuned. So again, I love that you did this too, Jonathan. We, how do you translate this? I mean, we can't go around taking the nerves out of people's skin. I don't think that would ever be HIPAA or IRB approved. So not really HIPAA, but IRB approved. So it comes back to this email that this patient sent me. And if you look at the last sentence, my question is, is there something I can do for my nerves to get rid of them completely? <laughs> so. We were at a Montana meeting, Barbara Gilcrest, who is an amazing role model for all women scientists out there, stood up and asked Steve Ostrowski, who was presenting this data at the meeting, who did all of the initial denervation work, well, have you thought about Botox, right? Botox also targets sensory nerve-derived peptides if you inject it intradermally. And so we did it. We injected our mice with botulinum neurotoxin, um, on one side and saline on the other and then we waited for a period of time and we looked at the skin and remarkably it worked. <laughs> this is like one of those experiments done by summer students that's not supposed to work. Totally worked. Um, it was incredible. My summer students got a co-author paper for working during the summer, not getting paid, like volunteer work. It was incredible. One of them was in high school still and it worked very similarly to what we saw. And then in collaboration with Erin Gilbert, who's here in the front row at the meeting, she had a patient who had a recalcitrant plaque on her buttock, difficult to put topical steroids on, treatment on, and Erin injected neurotoxin into this plaque, and within three weeks it was gone, and it stayed gone out for seven months. And then, of course, just like our wrinkles when we inject toxin into our forehead, it came back. But this is an idea. So if you have a patient that's clear to almost clear on a biologic and they have maybe one or two plaques that are driving them batty and they want to be clear for the very first time in their life, this may be something that is an option moving forward to eliminate this for a significant period of time for a fairly low level of cost. 
So I want to point out that there's an unrelated HSV outbreak in this patient on the other side that corresponded with the reemergence of the psor psoriasis plaque. And we actually have a paper in press right now, and this is what's crazy. I didn't know we were going to have a virus talk right before mine, but we have a paper that's coming out in press now showing that injection of neurotoxin around the perioral area in a patient was really effective at preventing recurrent labial HSV outbreaks. So in panel A, she came in with an infection as well as some um, herpes herpeticum. We cleared that with standard of care. I didn't, Dr. Gilbert did. And then she was injected with neurotoxin. And this patient has stayed really clear in the regions where she's had neurotoxin for year, over a year now, maybe even years, with repeated toxin injections. But you can see in the other lower lip that she has a HSV outbreak in regions that we didn't inject or Aaron injected. So neuroimmunology of psoriasis takeaways, if you get rid of the nerves, the disease, or the phenotype in the mouse improves. If you pharmacologically inhibit substance P or CGRP, um, it improves. If we put it back into denervated mouse, it comes back. The role of neurokinin 1 receptor substance P interactions, and this is complicated. Pro-inflammatory in the skin, suppressive coming in from the cells. Neurotoxin seems to be a possible option <laughs> for treating plaque and that it also may um, work for virus. So this is a, a huge team effort. This is years of work. Most of the work was done by Steve, um, who's now an uh, instructor at Harvard. Um, Aaron Gilbert did all the clinical work. E. Fritz, who is my lab manager for years, did all the mouse work. Um, and then, of course, the NIH has been so amazing in supporting my group. I want to thank them, too. So, Thanks, everyone, for coming. This is an amazing session. Thanks to the organizers. I hope to see this session um, on an annual basis going forward. Thank you. Time for one question. Hey, Nicole. Adriana. Great, great, great talk. Um, you know, we immunologists, basic and adaptive immunity immunologists, tend to look dendritic cells, tend to look cells, there are much more than that. Have you, I mean, for example, mast cells have a huge yeah. influence in all these diseases, and they respond with other receptors like MRGs different from the NK1 receptor. So I wonder in the studies that we are going to do in the future, we should really look into the role of each different cell in the concept of yeah. the... So I think that's a great idea. In the KC Titumus, we looked at mast cell numbers and they didn't change, but we didn't look at any mast cell derived factors. So that's a limiting factor. The amazingness of having a phlox mite, a mouse, is we can cross it with any cell specific promoter and start looking at the substance P specific, cell specific interactions in driving response to anything we can put on the skin and into any model that we can back cross it into. So I think it's, it was an enormous effort to generate the mouse, but I think now that we have it, we are going to be able to do amazing things. And I'm super excited about working with you. <laughs> the nerd in me is coming up here. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much. That was a great talk. You know, I'll just mention parenthetically that in the uh, 1970s, early 1970s, there were a number of reports of local anesthetics being injected into psoriasis and making it better. And, um, you know, I'm too lazy to actually do this, but for years I've been thinking about suggesting to a medical student or fellow that um, we take some uh, psoriasis patients with symmetric lesions and um, inject some with steroid, some with um, a local anesthetic, and some with steroid mixed with local anesthetic and see which works better. And the reason I say that is that many, many people uh, dilute their steroid in lidocaine before they inject the plaque. That's how I was taught to do this when I was a resident. And maybe it wasn't the steroid that made uh, the patient better, but uh, it's a great medical student or resident um, project. 
Um, our next speaker also, I think, needs no introduction, uh, Dan Kaplan uh, from the University of Pittsburgh. Dan has been a, um, uh, also a great uh, contributor to our understanding of the immunobiology of the skin. He's worked on antigen-presenting cells for many years and made a number of seminal uh, observations. Uh, in recent years, he's turned his attention to uh, the influence of the nervous system on immune processes, and I'm delighted that he's going to speak with us. Uh, he's going to talk about nociceptive nerves and defense against cutaneous candida infection. Dan. All right, thank you. So uh, thanks so much to our meeting organizer for putting together, I think, this really outstanding symposium. I think it's a very uh, timely topic, um, and it's, it's wonderful to be a part of it. And I also want to thank everyone who woke up so early to get here this morning after going to Harry Potter. Anyhow, so. Um, my lab is really focused on sort of cutaneous um, immunology and uh, not really on a particular disease, but more how the different parts of the skin contribute to both a productive or possibly a non-productive uh, immune response. Uh, we look at how sort of keratinocytes can affect, um, can affect dendritic cells um, and T cells in the skin, and also a little bit about how uh, nerves can modulate this, this um, whole process. So a lot of work we've done in the lab has focused on sort of a model of candida albicans skin infection. Now, I'm not really specifically trying to cure the candida albicans scourge that we all suffer from, but more thinking of it as like a model system for the skin. And so just using mouse models, it's a very simple infection model. You know, we found that Langerhan cells really don't uh, play much of a role during the initial early phase of clearing the infection, but it turns out that they are required for development of a Th17 response, which provides protection against uh, a secondary infection, as you might expect, um, with an amnestic response. But if you think about patients um, who have problems with chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis, um, many of them do have Th17 deficits, like if you look on the list of the right, there's, um, there's SCID, HIV, um, and step three, all of which have um, deficits in TH17, but there are also um, many patients who have uh, mutations that might suggest not so much a TH17, but more of a more global type one, a uh, type 17 um, defect, you know, such as the, the aposid patients in particular who have antibodies to uh, 17, AF, and, and 22. And so the question that we started off asking is, what is the role of the innate immune system in controlling candida in the skin? And now, mice are a wonderful model for this because unlike in humans where candida is a commensal, um, candida is foreign to mice. And so we can actually look at that initial response. And so the assays are super simple. We take a mouse, usually a unsuspecting mouse. We shave the back and then we put some candida on it. We wait three days. And then we basically harvest the skin and ask, well, what happened? And of course, we do this in a variety of knockout mouths using a reductionist approach to find out what's required. So this is the first experiment that we did. So this is just an uh, uh, IL-17AF double knockout mouse. And as you would have expected, as we expected, if you get rid of IL-17 cytokine AF, you have a lot more candida. This is just a measure of CFU in the skin three days after infection. It's a lot more, exactly as you would expect. So we're like, fantastic. It's an IL-17 mediated process. So then we did some work to identify, well, who is making the IL-17 in the skin? And this is just the last slide from that effort showing that if you look at a RAG1 knockout mouse, no alpha, beta, or gamma, delta T cells or B cells, you can see that um, there's an increased CFU. A TCR alpha knockout did not have that phenotype, so it was not the alpha, beta T cells. But if you use a gamma delta knockout, which is the graph on the right, the CFU is increased, and this really implicated the gamma delta T cells as the source of IL-17 early in infection. If you infect a mouse and come back in later, some very nice work from Tom Cupper has actually found that it's the alpha, beta T cells that are now the source of IL-17, sort of mimicking the, the, the human situation. So same idea, just a different cell type during the primary infection. In order to get IL-17 from a T cell, you usually need a cytokine trigger. 
And the most likely one is IL-23, and this is just data showing that if you do this very same infection in a mouse that is an IL-23 knockout, this is the graph on the left, you can see that when you infect with candida albicans, which is the black bars, it's uh, pretty significantly decreased in an IL-23 knockout, demonstrating that IL-23 is indeed required for host defense, uh, for the generation of the IL-17 positive gamma delta T cells. And then if you look on the graph on the right, this is the CFU. So you look, wild type has about 10 to the fourth, it's a little noisy. If you look at the IL-23 knockout, you can see there's a substantial increase in CFU. But then in the third column, this is an IL-23 knockout where what we have done is we have just injected some recombinant IL-17 um, back into the lesion itself. And you can see that it, it pretty much completely rescues the phenotype, demonstrating that the importance of IL-23 is really for the elicitation of IL-17. Um, and then just to look at the source of IL-23, this is maybe too many things on a slide. Um, if you delete all dendritic cells with a CD11C DTR mice, you can see that um, uh, you have the effect. Um, however, in the graph on the right, we have these complicated DC deficient mice. If you get rid of LCs and dermal CDC1, there's no phenotype. However, if you get rid of the dermal CDC2, these are also known as the CD11B dermal dendritic cells using the MGL2 deleter mice, you can see that the amount of IL-23 RNA as shown on the left graph is significantly decreased. This is three days after infection, and the CFU um, has increased. Now, we actually went to all the effort at a reviewer's kind suggestion and made the mixed bone marrow chimeras to formally demonstrate that IL-23 um, is indeed required from these CD301B um, dermal dendritic cells. Okay, so this leads us to the following half model. So in the case of a candida infection, we have IL-23 as a required cytokine. The source of this IL-23 is the uh, dermal CDC2. This IL-23, along with probable other factors, um, are uh, sufficient to drive um, IL-17 from gamma delta T cells, and then IL-17 does a number of, um, has a number of effects that promote an anti-candida response. Okay, so this was all fine and good. Um, and the, the student came to me and presented all of this, and I said, this is great, but it's really boring. So then we started thinking about it, and this is where we had like a little moment of inspiration. And so we realized that psoriasis is indeed an IL-17, IL-23 disease, and you might have noticed, even though I'm infecting mice with candida, it's the very same cytokines and the very same pathways we're looking at. And I'm not trying to make the argument that candida is a model for psoriasis, but you can think of psoriasis as a type 17 uh, uh, immune response where the antigen is persistent and it becomes chronic while we're looking at more of an acute version of that. So we know that anti-IL-23, um, both the P40 and even better, the P19 versions, improve disease really quite remarkably. And as Nicole has already introduced, there's this amiquimod model that is sort of a little bit like psoriasis that has the same sort of cytokine um, circuits that we see. And in these mice, we see that amiquimod um, drives IL-23 from DC, and from the same paper, the, the real Blanco paper from um, von Andren's lab found that pain afferents are required for IL-23 from dendritic cells, and in, in Nicole and um, Dr. Gilbert's work, we found that denervation um, inhibits melosomicomod and that Botox can actually um, improve psoriatic lesions as well as the uh, improvement. So we thought, well, maybe maybe this very same process is happening with our candida infection, and I wouldn't introducing it if it weren't the case. So we used resinifera toxin. So this is a capsaicin analog that efficiently deletes the, um, the pain-sensing trypv one positive nociceptors in the skin. And if you denervate the mice chemically, um, you can see, and then infect the mice and look three days later, you can see that uh, IL-23 is reduced, um, and then the number of IL-17 producing gamma delta T cells is also reduced. And then if you look at the CFU, it's also increased. So this is fantastic. These nerves are really required. We did the um, Nicole Ward experiment where we denervated, we hemi-denervated the mouse, and this is comparing the sham side versus the denervated side. And I think as you can appreciate, the IL-23 is reduced, the IL-17 is reduced, and the CFU is increased. And so we were pretty confident that this was true. To get a sense of how this was working, uh, we went to the InGen database and then looked at the, um, 
the neuropeptide receptors expressed on the different DC. We knew that the CD11B DC, which is the third column there, was the DC that mattered, and we were quite surprised to find that the CGRP receptors seemed to be um, more highly expressed on those cells. And as we heard earlier, CGRP receptors expressed on LCs, and I'm not saying it's not, it's just the CDC2 seemed to have the highest level of expression, at least in mice. So if you do this candida infection again, and now you inject CGRP agonist, which is the middle graph, um, you can see you have more IL-17 being made, the antagonist less IL-17 being made, and this correlates nicely with CFU, where you have, when you inject CGRP, you are able to reduce the CFU um, three days later, and then the um, antagonist has increased CFU. So this led us to the following model, which is, um, you have these pain-sensing TRPV1 fibers that um, are activated to secrete uh, CGRP alpha. This then activates the CDC2 to make IL-23, that make IL-17 from gamma delta T cells, and those recruit neutrophils and clear the lesion. So two more questions in the last little bit we have here. Do nerves actually directly sense candida albicans? Um, this was actually a reviewer's question, and this is being run on a PC, not a Mac, I guess. Um, anyhow, so this was actually a very nice joke where <laughs> these are the emoji. So I, there's a neuroscientist who works in lab now, and um, she communicates by emojis. I don't know if that's a neuroscience thing or not. And so what she does is the assay is as follows. We take candida, you have to heat kill them, and then we wash them a whole bunch and you separate out the juice from the heat killed from the candida itself, wash everything a whole bunch of times, um, and then we take isolated DRGs. Um, from uh, wild-type mice, add either the effluents or the cell bodies to, in a 96-well plate, wait 10 minutes, harvest the supermatant, and ask, what do you get? And so this is just looking at CGRP release. And if you look at the graph on the left, you can see that the heat killed um, yeast is um, quite sufficient to uh, release pretty good amounts of CGRP. But what's interesting is the cell bodies are not. So there's something released from the candida that makes the CGRP, but the cell bodies are not sufficient. It's a MIDE88 independent process, if you look on the right. And it turns out that what you need is you need beta-glucan. So beta-glucan is part of the cell wall of candida. And if you look on the graph on the left, you can see that if you pre-treat with beta-glucanase, um, you lose the effect. And if you heat kill the beta-glucanase, it doesn't happen. So it's a nice control. And then if you look at a dectin-1 knockout, these are DRGs from a dectin-1 knockout in the middle there, you can see it's partially reduced. But quite curiously, this is a CARD-9 independent process. Turns out it's a RAF1 dependent. Um, uh, so, yes, indeed, candida can um, activate beta-glucan. Um, however, it is not sufficient to activate beta-glucan. So you can see that the, the, the effluence from the candida does indeed release the CGRP, but purified forms of beta-glucan in the cell bodies are not sufficient. And what we actually think is happening, based partially on other people who have published the same sort of thing, regrettably, that uh, it's a combination of trip v one trip a one agonists from the candida. I don't know what those agonists are, and they need to cooperate with uh, beta-glucan through dectin-1 to lead to CGRP release. Okay, so the last little bit. I've showed you that nociceptors are required for the candida response through the elaboration of CGRP acting on dendritic cells. The question we have now is, are nociceptors sufficient to activate type 17 immunity? So the way we go about doing this is we use optogenetics. So optogenetics, which you may be aware of, is basically there's this particular receptor called channel rhodopsin, shown here as CHR2. Um, this allows for ion fluxes once activated by blue light. The mice that we use are trip v one Cree, and then there's a Rosa 26 lock stop locks channel rhodopsin YFP mice. Um, I'm just going to call it trip v one AI32. That's the shorthand for this mouse. And the experiment is basically take the mouse, shine blue light on it, wait a little while, take the skin, ask what happens. And so the advantage of this is now we are able to specifically activate uh, the trip v one subset of nociceptors, and there's no needle stick, there's no manipulation, it's all very isolated. And this is what you get. I was actually kind of surprised that this works. So this is some histology, uh, I think four days after um, 
uh, laser stimulation, and as you can see on the left, it's relatively normal looking skin. But if you look on the right, you get a pretty brisk infiltration. It's largely a, 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 a lymphocytic and, histi and um, neutrophilic infiltrate on the right. You I hope you can appreciate there's acanthosis and there's parakeratosis as well. I'm not saying it's psoriasis, I'm just saying that there's inflammation like that. Uh, this is, this is um, uh, ear skin. And if you look at the, um, the skin inflammation scores, so the top is thickness, erythema, scaling, and then sort of a composite um, inflammation score. This is adapted from the scores that people use for amiquimod. They call POSSE scores, but I'm just going to call it an inflammation score. And I hope you can appreciate that over the course of five days, um, that indeed the skin that is exposed to the blue laser light becomes quite inflamed, and the um, the line that doesn't move is light that has been, uh, mice that have been exposed to the blue laser light, but they're, they're not carrying the Cree. So that's the negative control. And we've also done um, but the, the AI-32 mice that didn't get the light and it, it's all negative. So you do indeed get a brisk inflammation that accumulates over a couple days. If you look at the cytokines, this is now just um, doing RNA analysis of the skin. You find that IL-23 is evident six hours after the first exposure peaks at 48 and then declines. TNF is also present very early, uh, as you can see on the top. And then if you look in the bottom, IL-6, IL-17, and IL-22 are not present early at six hours. But once the inflammation gets going, you can see a very nice accumulation of these uh, sort of classical type 17 cytokines. Um, if you just do now a, a cellular analysis of the skin, you can find that uh, dermal gamma delta T cells are increased. C4 T cells are increased, and neutrophils are also increased, as you would expect, consistent with the histology. Um, and then if you look at the number of cells expressing IL-17, it's really the gamma delta C T cells that are expressing the lion's share of IL-17, um, and CD4 T cells as well. And then finally, in the last slide, if you now shine the laser light and do a candida infection, what you find is that you get about a log and a half, almost two logs of protection against a candida infection um, when you infect at the stimulated site. That's on the left of the graph. But if you look at a, a distant site that's far away from the laser light, you don't see any protection. So the um, activation of the nociceptors is sufficient to provide um, local host defense to candida at the site of the laser, not far away. But curiously, if you look next to the um, next to the laser light, you can see that you also have some protection. So then, just to conclude, I'd like to um, posit that nociceptors are both necessary and sufficient for the development of type 17 um, immune responses in the skin in the context of uh, candida albicans. Um, we find that they are sufficient for um, protection, and either abrogation leads to the exaggerated response and the um, uh, activation in isolation using optogenetics is sufficient to provide um, host defense. Now, I think, although I've been focused on um, host defense in the context of this type 17 pathogen, I think this is really most exciting, as Nicole has alluded to earlier, about the relationship between this pathway and autoimmune skin diseases such as psoriasis. And I, I think this work provides a rich set of uh, potential therapeutic targets uh, for future exploration. Thank you very much. And wait, can I have that last slide up again? I forgot to thank everyone. Anyhow, so um, just to, the key things is that uh, this work was done by Sakin Kashem at the beginning, and Jonathan Cohen has picked up and done the optogenetics works, and Tara Edwards has done um, all of the CGRP in vivo work, and our collaborators, Brian Davis and uh, Kathy Albers at Pittsburgh. Anyhow, thank you. Time for one question. Can I ask a question? Yeah. What will um, happen if you expose the whole body to laser light or any kind of a non-ionizing radiation? Um, so the laser light is, is, is a blue, blue laser light. So it's a, not really possible to expose the whole mouse to the laser light, lasers being spots, right? But what we have done is we have developed an um, array of LEDs 
of the correct color. And we can put the mouse and we can expose like half the mouse, like the whole back and the ears uh, to the laser light. And what you find is you get uh, the exact same thing that so I'm showing now. Hemibody exposure. Yes. That will give an enhanced uh, um, response. That's, that's correct. If you expose the, like the entire back to the laser light in a, not sorry, to the LED array, you get a similar cytokine and inflammation um, uh, pathways and parameters that I showed you uh, in the ears with the laser light. So it's from, very, very similar. From a therapeutic point of view, it has a great significance. I am working on this line. Please allow me to meet you later. I'd be delighted to. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, the uh, first time I ever heard the, um, the acronym CGRP was from Ethan Lerner. And it was, I believe, 1989. There had been a paper by um, a first author with some name Nong saying that this neuropeptide CGRP did some funky things to macrophages. And uh, here we are almost 30 years later, and uh, CGRP is the uh, gift that keeps on giving, it seems. Um, anyway, uh, I'd like to uh, spend a few minutes talking a little bit about a, um, a pathway that um, uh, may exist uh, through which um, neuropeptides, and I'm going to talk only about CGRP today, uh, can have actions through endothelial cells and, and through those endothelial cells regulate some aspects of uh, cutaneous immunity. And I hope you'll find this interesting. Um, one, oh, here it is. I'm pushing the, uh, the wrong thing. Okay. So um, these are a few disclosures. They're really not uh, particularly relevant to what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so CGRP, we've heard a lot about CGRP. We've heard a lot about CGRP and its immunoregulatory activities, its uh, effect on viral infections, and, um, and uh, its uh, role in uh, psoriasis. Uh, so I'd like to focus for a moment on its role in psoriasis. So why, why did we start doing this? And I'm not saying that this pathway that I'm going to describe has anything to do with psoriasis, but it was really from uh, this earlier work by others uh, that got us thinking about this. So um, CGRP concentrations are elevated in the plasma of patients with psoriasis, and uh, particularly interesting uh, for what I'm going to talk about, uh, it's been reported that CGRP is present on the surface of endothelial cells in lesions of uh, psoriasis. And of course, uh, dermal blood vessels and the secondary lymphoid organs are innervated. Uh, the, there, it has also been long known that endothelial cells have a very central role in inflammatory uh, skin disorders, both by control of, uh, call, the control of uh, exit of inflammatory cells from the vasculature and by production of both peptide and non-peptide factors regulating inflammation. So we um, became uh, interested in uh, uh, the role of CGRP in signaling through endothelial cells and what this might mean for some immune responses. So as you can see here, this just demonstrates that both um, uh, blood vessels within uh, the skin and um, draining lymph nodes are innervated by nerves that contain CGRP. Not a surprise, of course. And um, we also knew, and then this is, uh, we, uh, we also know from Nicole Ward's work, she actually showed uh, um, uh, these very photos uh, earlier in her talk, that, that when you denervate skin in her TIE2 uh, uh, model of psoriasiform dermatitis, the psoriasis, uh, the psoriasiform dermatitis improves, and you can, and some aspects of that can be inhibited by administration of CGRP, as, as Nicole showed earlier. Uh, again, suggesting a central role for CGRP. So we did sort of a crazy experiment. Uh, we had this idea that you know, CGRP is important, and endothelial cells are important, and nerves are important. So we did sort of this crazy experiment where we took uh, primary uh, dermal microvascular endothelial cells. We co-cultured them with uh, Langerhans cells as antigen-presenting cells, uh, responsive uh, CD4 positive T cells. These were from DO 11.1 uh, mice that spontaneously recognize a fragment of chicken ovalbumin. 
Uh, so we put everything together, including antigen, uh, washed the cells, and uh, we looked at a cytokine response. And the experimental variable was treating the endothelial cells with CGRP or not CGRP, then washing them carefully so that we're not putting free CGRP into the co-culture, then adding those CGRP-treated or non-treated endothelial cells to the antigen-presenting cultures. And then uh, initially we looked simply at cytokine responses. So as shown here, um, and um, let's see if we can get this pointer to work. So, so we take these co-cultures and we measure the cytokine response. So if we simply have Langerhans cells responding CD4 positive T cells and antigen, we get a response like this looking at interleukin 17A, so IL-17A. We add the endothelial cells and we get some more IL-17A, a modest increase. What happens if we pretreat those endothelial cells with CGRP? We then get a very large increase in IL-17A. How about other cytokines, IL-6? we get a very large increase in interleukin-6. Curiously, if we look at uh, gamma interferon, yes, so this is our positive control, then we add endothelial cells to the mix and we get more, we get a lot more gamma interferon. But if those endothelial cells have first seen CGRP, it completely abrogates the increase in gamma interferon. Same thing for interleukin-22, same thing for interleukin-4. So adding the endothelial cells increases the response, but pretreatment with CGRP completely abrogates the increase. Now, the first experiments we did simply had all of the cells mixed in the same wells. We then wanted to ask the question, um, does, is cell-cell contact between the endothelial cells and either the antigen-presenting cells or the T cells uh, required for this effect? And it turns out, you don't need cell-cell contact. So shown here, we then did experiments separating the endothelial cells from the, uh, uh, the antigen-presenting cells and the T cells, and it still works. It still works exactly the same way. Um, I'll also point out that this is not unique to Langerhans cells. We've done this also with uh, bone marrow-derived uh, dendritic cells, and you find basically the same, uh, the same effect. If we look uh, at message levels for these uh, cytokines, uh, we find a very similar effect for most of them. Um, again, shown here, uh, this is our looking at um, uh, message levels for IL-17A. This is just uh, without the endothelial cells. We add the endothelial cells. We get more message. If the endothelial cells are pretreated with CGRP, we get a lot more. Uh, same thing for IL-6. And similar to what we saw at the protein level with gamma interferon IL-22, um, when we add the endothelial cells, we get more message, but pretreatment with CGRP completely abrogates the increase in message. IL-4 was a little bit different. We find um, uh, that adding the endothelial cells um, causes a perhaps perhaps a small decrease, probably no significant decrease in message levels for IL-4. Pre-treating with CGRP brings it down a little bit more, although it did not reach uh, statistical significance with the end uh, uh, of our experiments. Um, one other thing. Yeah. So um, uh, if we do f uh, facts analysis, simply to look at the proportion of cells that um, that contain uh, intracellular cytokines of interest, uh, we find a similar uh, response. For example, looking at uh, interleukin-17, uh, these two are our controls. If, we, if we're looking at, uh, at the uh, upper left quadrant, uh, um, uh, looking at the number of IL-17, the proportion of IL-17A uh, expressing cells, um, if we uh, add uh, endothelial cells, we get uh, this number, but if the endothelial cells uh, are uh, pretreated with CGRP, we roughly double the proportion of cells expressing IL-17A. In terms of um, gamma interferon, uh, we find that, it, uh, that we, uh, more, we decrease the number of uh, gamma interferon-containing cells by more than half. Um, looking at expression of ROR gamma T, TBET, GATA3, we find uh, similar uh, uh, results. Um, looking at the, uh, the responding T cells, 
Um, when we pretreat uh, the uh, endothelial cells with CGRP, we get a great increase in expression of ROR gamma T, consistent with what we see with uh, IL-17. Uh, with TBET, we get a, a great decrease when we pretreat the uh, endothelial cells uh, with CGRP, and a small decrease in gamma in GATA3. So we. We, the next uh, series of experiments were to try to identify what soluble factors might be produced by um, endothelial cells in response to exposure to CGRP that could be responsible for the effect biasing the outcome of antigen presentation away from a Th1 response and towards uh, a Th17 response. And it turns out that interleukin-6 is at least partially uh, responsible for the effect, and I'll show this here. Um, we used siRNA to, um, uh, to IL-6. Uh, we treated the uh, endothelial cells with the siRNA uh, or non-target uh, uh, RNA. And uh, uh, let me just show it. Let's just focus on um, uh, these uh, two sets of bars on uh, right. So looking at IL-17A, um, if we if we, uh, looking at non-target cells, we do get, non, I'm sorry, non-target uh, treated cells, we get, uh, and uh, when we treat these cells with CGRP and do our uh, same assay, we find an increase in IL-17A uh, in the responding T cells. However, if we block IL-6 production with, with um, siRNA, we do not get that decrease, and there are similar uh, blocking the production of IL-6 produces um, an analogous effect on IL-6. Uh, on gamma interferon production by the responding T cells, we get the opposite. We get an increase in production, which is exactly what we would expect if we're inhibiting the pathway that we've described. Um, interleukin-22 and interleukin-4 are interesting. There's almost no effect on production of interleukin-22 and no effect at all on uh, production of interleukin-4, and it appears that uh, although the pathway is operative, um, IL-6 by itself is not sufficient in any event to, to uh, be responsible for those changes, and at the moment now we don't know what other factors may be involved. Um, so fi having found that IL-6 did something in this system and was seemed to be sufficient for some of the endpoints we've been looking at, um, uh, we did a rather simple uh, experiment, um, and this was in response to a reviewer, of course. <laughs> we simply added IL-6 instead of uh, endothelial cells or endothelial cells uh, treated uh, with CGRP to culture, antigen-presenting cultures. And uh, here's what we found. So um, when we add IL-6, we get exactly uh, the same sort of response as if we added CGRP-treated endothelial cells. We get an increase, dose-dependent increase in IL-17A, a dose-dependent decrease in gamma interferon, a uh, dose-dependent decrease in IL-4, no change in IL-22, however. Again, um, IL-6 doesn't seem to be sufficient to uh, make these changes in IL-22. And even though we see um, a decrease in IL-4, our experiments as a whole would suggest that um, IL-4 regulation is, not, is somewhat different and more complicated than simply IL-6. So then uh, this was kind of interesting. We said, well, what happens? Uh, you know, maybe this is all solely an in vitro phenomenon. So we did a really simple experiment. We simply injected some CGRP intradermally into mice and then immunized them at the site of the CGRP. Control animals received diluent without CGRP. Um, and then, uh, as you can see, we then, uh, so we immunized them to dinitrofluorobenzene. Three days later, we removed the draining lymph nodes. Uh, isolated CD4 positive T cells, um, stimulated them uh, with anti CD3 and uh, anti CD28, and looked at the cytokine content of supernatants. And so, what you can see here uh, that we saw a modest increase in IL 17A 
Uh, and although this was modest, all of these parameters were picked out of the air. The timing, the dose, I mean, it just made it up. It's amazing. It worked at all. Um, gamma interferon was down. IL-22 was down, just as we saw in the uh, in vitro experiments. However, IL-4 was, was different. We saw IL-4 go up rather than down. Now, of course, um, we don't know where this is working. We have no idea if that has anything to do with endothelial cells. This is the mouse as a black box. And, um, and indeed, we've, we've uh, published previously that, um, that uh, CGRP exposure of longer Han cells, for instance, leads to enhanced uh, um, uh, uh, IL-4, enhanced Th2 activity. And there's a group in Japan that has also uh, confirmed that. And, and so um, uh, this is a mouse as black box. But, but something happened. Um, so the question is, does this pathway really operate in vivo or is this sort of an in vitro phenomenon and, you know, who knows? Um, part of the answer uh, will be presented uh, <laughs> this afternoon, uh, abstract uh, 23, and it's uh, be discussed in the selected e-poster uh, uh, discussion uh, later on today, at, supposedly at 12.48. So um, what we did was we, uh, we engineered uh, a mouse that uh, does not ex uh, express uh, RAMP1 in endothelial cells, and you'll see what its phenotype is. <laughs> um, so um, uh, I'm going to uh, conclude simply by, by saying that uh, it appears that uh, uh, it seems to be a real, an operative pathway, whether it has anything to do with inflammatory skin disease, I don't really know I, at this point. But it does appear that CGRP can um, alter the biology of endothelial cells such that they are able to bias the outcome of antigen presentation, acting as bystanders um, in the in vitro experiments. Um, and this may have a physiological relevance, perhaps has a role in cutaneous adaptive immunity and skin disorders um, characterized by inappropriate uh, or deleterious immune activity. IL-6 appears to be a necessary mediator for many, but not all of these CGRP effects. And uh, um, uh, whether it is, it, it, whether it is um, sufficient, it appears to be sufficient by itself for some of the effects. Uh, uh, whether it's necessary uh, by itself is not completely certain. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, we have uh, an, in, uh, an interesting question has been whether is the CGR, I'm sorry, is the interleukin-6 which is released working on the antigen presenting cell or on the responding T cell. We have some information on that, uh, abstract 24, uh, and, and the answer is that it appears to be working on the longer Han cell. Uh, exactly how, what it is doing to the longer Han cell is not certain. There is data that other antigen presenting cells can transpresent IL-6 on CD126 to responding T cells. Perhaps that's what's happening, but we're not absolutely certain. Uh, with that, I want to thank the people uh, who were involved in this. Uh, Wan Hong Ding, in particular, did a great deal uh, of uh, this work. Laurie Stahl has done a lot of work on it. On uh, more recent uh, work on these systems, uh, 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 Cheyenne Azizi, uh, uh, Jimmy Lamb, Davina Mehta, who are uh, in the audience, were involved. Junichi Hozoe, I want to credit. Uh, he didn't work on this initially, but in our early work on CGRP and antigen presenting cells, he was absolutely instrumental. He's at the meeting. I don't know if he's in the room, but thank you, Junichi, uh, if you uh, are here. Ethan Lerner uh, was involved in uh, earlier studies. And with that, I think uh, I'd better stop talking. Thank you very much. I reach terrific Hi. as usual. And this thing is better and better. And I love the story of the IL-6. But one of the reasons I like it is also because what is close to nerves and endothelial cells are mast cells. Right. And which are the main producers in the skin besides the endothelial cells, which is fascinating, are mast cells. So I wonder if you are looking a little bit further into the role of that mast cells can have kicking out the function of the endothelial cells? Yeah, we really haven't done that, but it would be a lot of fun to do some of these experiments with mast cell deficient mice and see, see what happens. I absolutely agree. Okay, well, at this point, let me ask the other speakers to come up and, uh, uh, and sit at this table. We have about seven minutes uh, for questions, if there are any. For, for anybody, of course.
Okay, uh, the floor is open. Hi, Marla Spassett from UC San Francisco. Nicole, I have a question for you about your bone marrow chimeras. Because this bone marrow chimeras in the skin are complicated because a lot of hematopoietic cells stay around and are tissue resident and relatively radio resistant. So I wonder if the cells that you think are conferring the, the anti-inflammatory effects of the skin are hematopoietic or other structural cells like keratinocytes and possibly nerves. Are the micro could the microphones be turned on? I'm I'm assuming that you the guy in the back has really all the power at this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> it's not me. That's a that's a great question. You know, the way we did the chimeras, we were smart, so we put um, male bone marrow into the female mice so we could track it, but we haven't. Um, we just, you know, have have sort of captured cells out with laser capture and looked at them and, and, and done things like that. Um, I don't know, I don't think I have the answer to your question yet. I think I was particularly interested because the gamma delta T cells tend to not turn over very efficiently. And yeah. those are a great source of IL-17 production in skin. Y yeah, we, you know, in this mouse, the KC Tai 2 mouse, it's really alpha beta T cell driven and I, it, I, it may be because they're it, the, just the gamma delta T cells in this model, in the chronic model, we haven't found to be really driving the phenotype, um, which is different than the amicma mod. So it may hold up in the amicma mod model. I'm not as sure it will hold up in the chronic model. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Hiju Kim. I'm from Korea. Thank you guys for a nice talk. Um, I'm not asking uh, to a specific speaker. But what I was wondering is that when you put um, protopic or elidel, you can feel a bit, little bit of stinging sometimes. And um, for psoriasis or even other immune-mediated uh, immune skin disease, protopic and elidel works. Um, of course, their uh, main mechanism would be anti-inflammatory effects. But from your, you guys' talk, I wonder, probably because they are said to deplete those substance P and um, decrease the TRPV1 activation or sort of things. So do you think um, that could be one of the mechanisms that um, those um, topical calcineurin inhibitors work on psoriasis or other immune diseases? Well, I've, I've wondered that too. It's a great question, but I have no insight to provide on leave, that topic. I'm leaving it to the doctors. Maybe, you know, <laughs> Ethan, what do you think? Ethan might know. <laughs> oh, you weren't paying attention. Elidil and protopic, um, could they be working through um, nerves? S s since you have like that, the, the pain heat phenomenon, could mm -hmm. it be like a desensitization? Or, it, or even itch. So um, do you have, do you guys have any suggestion if I want to um, explore the possible mechanism related to those things? Probably not even humans. Probably well, it might be interesting. Like One could look in principle at whether the application of calcineurin inhibitors prevents the release of neuropeptides from nerves. Yeah. I mean, that, that could certainly be looked at and uh, would be consistent with your hypothesis. Uh, I'll also just mention that uh, cap, there is some uh, literature suggesting that capsaicin uh, improves psoriasis and presumably does so because it depletes um, uh, uh, sensory uh, nerves of uh, the, their, uh, some of their neuropeptides. There was actually a company uh, that uh, tried to bring this to market as a treatment for psoriasis, but it didn't, it didn't make the big time. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk so to all of you. I was just wondering whether um, the denervation uh, change uh, rather the change in the number of T cells, uh, change the phenotypes as someone has been reporting an increase of uh, regulatory T cells. Mm. Did you look at T Rex? Uh, yeah, so no, so um, the phenotype of the T cells themselves is unchanged. Okay. What we, you have to remember, we're looking, uh, you're talking about in the context of the candida infection, so we're looking in the context of a strong type 17 response. Right? So what we basically see is the same kind of response, but reduced 90% in intensity. What we haven't really looked at very carefully is what happens to the skin under homeostatic conditions. Mm -hmm. There's nothing obvious, and there's no huge you know, screaming phenotype, but we haven't looked at subtle changes um, 
in, in TRIX. The numbers are the same, but it's possible that there is some alteration in their function that if we looked carefully enough, we would find. And it, I mean, same in psoriasis, right? Uh, 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 Kevin Cooper's work has shown that the Tregs in psoriasis in patients um, don't change in number, but rather they change in their ability to be responsive. Um, and if he's in the audience, I'm going to peer pressure him publicly right now to let's study the Tregs in the KC Titumos, because <laughs> we haven't looked yet. Thanks. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe just to add, so <clears throat> at least in, in our hands looking in, in, uh, in humanized mice and actually uh, starting first uh, looking at just normal mice where we apply CGRP to see if there is any increase in any immune cell population. So that's generally just looking at macrophages, B cells and T cells just all together without looking at subpopulation. We don't see any differences when we topically apply CGRP to the vagina of these normal mice. So. I, it might probably affect function more than it will affect numbers or distribution, in my opinion, yeah, that's but really that's to look into really carefully. That's wild. It's totally consistent across the four of us. Ethan? Uh, well, well, this question or comment is a little bit facetious. Um, <laughs> of course. But, but, but playing off of the comment from uh, the, the patient that Nicole Ward referred to, um, why do we need these nerves? It seems as if all they do is cause problems in the skin. Because <laughs> if you don't have them, you're going to get hurt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they do, they do other things, um, uh, and they protect us against HIV also. Um, but, uh, uh, but uh, um, you know, why, why did these functions evolve? Um, that's always, um, you know, these teleologic questions are always uh, difficult. You know, something I was thinking about was the fact that um, uh, how does stress play into these effects that, uh, that all of us have been discussing? There's, a, again, a group from Japan showed uh, in the, uh, I think, the late 1990s that stress enhances the CGRP content of the skin, yeah. uh, at least if you're a mouse. And um, uh, what does that mean or, uh, uh, for any of these endpoints? And uh, is it relevant to some of, uh, to inflammatory skin disease, to protection against viral infections? Who knows? But, I mean, Ralph Paz has shown that stress impacts hair loss, yeah. and that's all nerve-derived, too. Right. So there's this yin and yang about the role of the nerves, in, at least in the skin, as I hope you can appreciate. Sometimes, I mean, they're, they're absolutely critical. We would burn our hands off and, and, and cut ourselves and never know if we didn't have nerves in the skin. But at the same time, you know, if, if they become activated because we're stressed out or they become activated because of... Um, inflammation or disease, they, they can both be protective but also detrimental. Um, it's complicated, which means we all in this room have job security to some degree. <laughs> it's, it's maybe uh, worth to notice in this context that if, at least speaking about uh, uh, the sexual response, so you probably have a role of these nociceptors during uh, sexual response because of secretion of CGRP. It's a vasodilator. It will increase blood flow in the vagina. It's relatively uh, known, although it's a bit, not a lot is known about, but it has been demonstrated that CGRP will contribute to penile erection. So it yeah. has a role in this, and you can say that on the other side when maybe when you have sexual intercourse, so just like think about it, you have some friction, you have some heat, uh, maybe this is actually enough to but, like, but, but, activate but, these neurons and I'd, secrete I'd like CGRP. Out, I'd, I'd like to point out that these are nociceptors and not gentle touch. Yeah, so. <laughs> well, some, so some, some people it, like it, pain, it, right? It have like a dual, <laughs> dual role <laughs> there. So just think about it because uh, uh, whenever like we present the stuff, so you need to think Russian. about how people have sex and what happens during sex. So clearly you have something going on and probably you have some CGRP there in the system. Yeah. And uh, uh, the fact, at least in the context of, of uh, uh, HIV, the fact that it's there, it will actually just reduce the rate of transmission. This is why HIV is actually not that efficient during transmission, so it might play a role. So all of this needs to like, be taken into consideration yeah. in the bigger picture bigger of picture. what these yeah. neurons the do. Th they, they have a role. They are not there for nothing. Yeah. Yeah, by the way, uh, uh, Jonathan had mentioned in his talk about uh, CGRP inhibitors and migraine, the FDA approved the Amgen Novartis uh, product yesterday. So um, uh, you have to see whether these people have, what their psoriasis is like uh, when they're, uh, they're getting it. So I'm get, we're getting the wrap-up signal from Jim. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. 
very quickly, I know that I talk a lot today, but I deserve it because I came late from Harry Potter <laughs> and I was here very early. So um, I appreciate the first talk from Jonathan that in where he shows some of the autocrine effect. So we know cells produce neuropeptides. And as Dan showed, we know that they are really necessary. So I would like to have a little bit of your insight, and maybe we we'll talk later somewhere. Because do you think that is a thing about kinetics or positive uh, feedback loop? In yeah, the, I mean, like I a think nurse? you can see from most of us, we're all starting to do cell-specific approaches with switches, either whether they're optogenic or diphtheria toxin inducible or tamoxin. We're all starting to look at experimental approaches to uh, answer that question, which is how do you tweak out the cell-specific interactions and the timing, right? Yeah. I, I, think, um, I think we'd better stop oh, okay. now uh, so the, since I, I think the room has to be used for something else. So. Um, uh, we can continue this discussion in the hallway. Thank you all for coming. I'm really grateful. And don't, don't, don't forget, tomorrow uh, there's a session two on neuroimmunology, same place uh, at 7 a.m. Thank you.